Welcome all. Uh, my name is Eva Biodé. I'm, uh, I'm in Helsinki at the moment. I'm a Finnish member of parliament and a human rights activist um, in a very safe spot in Helsinki. Um, I have the, the great honor to have been invited to, to a little bit to moderate and host uh, this fantastic, interesting panel and discussion um, uh, which is called For Every Nazarene, in, which is in solidarity with all human rights defenders around the world. Uh, this film that, that we are actually gathering around highlights actually just one of the human rights defenders, Nasrin's story, uh, but there are hundreds uh, and thousands of Nasrins all around the world. Um, and we are here to discuss uh, with some of them and about the situation of, of others and what would be uh, our roles, the government role, but also our roles as activists in ensuring that their voices are not silenced, that we really give them space and hear their voices and raise uh, um, knowledge about what is going on in these countries. I have with me today, uh, and, and this last year, perhaps during this horrible pandemic, um, in many countries, um, actually tens and tens, I think 83 countries actually is, are reported to have been, uh, um, to have been um, used COVID-19 as a justification, uh, for instance, to attack free speech. We also have seen the rise of the far right, some kind of neo uh, neoconservative conservatism or traditionalism or religious fundam fundamentalism has made it more difficult to fight for women's rights. Mm. And especially they have been targeting uh, women and feminist human rights defenders. So we are indeed in a very important uh, moment at the moment. Um, I think I will have, I have, we have with me uh, the producers and writers uh, of the film Nasrin, uh, but also human rights defenders from different places on the world. Um, and I, I hope that there is a possibility to show the next clip, Tara. I don't know if you are ready for that. Uh, if the, the tech, technology is working or should we just go on in introduce, introducing Jeff and Marsha? Unfortunately, you have to go on. Catherine's uh, WhatsApp me a picture of her screen, which is completely frozen blue. So she's having oh, a nightmare. So oh please no. just carry on. But we, okay, we live in, in with, you know, keep our thumbs up and, and we just go on. So I would actually just uh, bring you to, to Jeff and Marza, Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross, who actually have been, are the, the persons behind this fantastic and very touching, important film. Uh, please. Uh, you have the floor or the screen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And really, I think the message of this gathering and of your work is just absolutely uh, essential and key to what Nazreen believes in as well. And as far as the technological complications, you know, uh, fighting for human rights is all about overcoming obstacles. So it's a metaphor for the fact that we can move forward despite an occasional complication. Um, it's, it's interesting that you're talking about not only equality now, but also many Nazarenes out there, the, the nameless Nazarenes. Uh, when we, when Marsha and I first approached Nazarene so today about doing a documentary about her work in 2016, um, we had a, a common goal, Marsha and I did, that Nazarene's story would open up the story of many others and give inspiration for a new generation of activists. And interestingly enough, and maybe this is why we bonded with Nazreen and her husband Reza, was that Nazreen, as she always does, says, well, you can do a film about me, but it really has to be about others. So we actually didn't have to argue about that. We believed in that. Nazreen always wants to use uh, her public position to shine a light on others. Now, I can tell you right now, that Nazarene Sotoday is in one of the worst prisons in the world. It's a women's prison called Garchak Prison. She's in a cell that's eight feet by 13 feet uh, with 12 beds, uh, uh, bunk beds. So there's uh, six rows of beds uh, in that tiny little space, no windows, low ceilings, 
uh, poor water, horrible food. She has COVID and she also has a heart condition. And that's where they put her, separated from her loved ones, her children and her husband. Um, but, uh, you know, when she got, first got sent to, to guard check, she said something privately that I don't think she'll mind being said, which was, well, no one really knows that much about what's going on in guard check. This gives me a chance to get out their stories. And that's just the remarkable thing about Nazarene. It's all about others. And so as we talk about Nazarene, please remember that there are thousands of political prisoners, women and men, uh, whose names aren't known and who are suffering now and who stand for what we stand for. And uh, public pressure can make a difference. We need to keep fighting for all of them. So um, while we were making the film, we started making the film in 2016. And while we were making the film, Nazreen started representing uh, some of the, uh, the women who were uh, out in the streets taking off their headscarves, uh, protesting the mandatory hijab law in Iran. So the movement called the Girls of Revolution Street. And she was arrested for this work on behalf of her clients. And that's why actually she's in prison at the moment. She uh, was sentenced to 38 years and 174 lashes uh, for this, for you know, being an attorney who cared about other people's human rights. I mean, she's, she's really in many ways become a role model too. I mean, a lot of young women really look up to her and she, uh, in terms of you know, their willingness to put themselves on the line as she has. And, um, you know, she's, she's really a, an incredibly fearless and strategic person. And just in what, what Jeff was saying, I mean, you know, when she was in Aveen, I mean, she had one hunger strike initially because she had an elderly woman in her cell and she was able to get that woman out. And then she went on a really, really long hunger strike um, over the summer, almost 47 days. And we were just worried every day that she was not going to make it. It was just horrible. But, you know, she was using her voice in a way, in the only way she could, to bring attention to the horrible health conditions. You know, as you know, COVID is pretty rampant in, and I mean, it's rampant in prisons in the United States. And it's also obviously rampant in Iran and the governments, you, you brought this up actually, Eva, but you know, the governments don't care. I mean, it's not a way to just get rid of people, you know, forget about them, let them die in prison from COVID, then they don't take responsibility. So, you know, she's always, th as Jeff says, you know, her main concern is about the rights of others. And, you know, that is really uh, what she is all about. I mean, that's what she, that is her thing in life, you know, the rights of other people and making a difference and not staying silent about it. Thank you, Jeff and Marsha. I think it's uh, amazing how she actually uses the law in, in, and, and, you know, in trying to uh, defend these people who are uh, with unjust convictions and unjust uh, imprisonment and, and terrible conditions. And of course, that is, of course, one reason why Equality Now also, I mean, this is so close because Equality Now also is trying to make legislation, change legislation, uh, to stop discriminatory laws, of course, and of course, to see that that uh, feminist human rights defenders and human rights defenders for feminist cause uh, are protected as they should, according to international law. Um, I will thank you, uh, Jeff uh, and Marsha. We will come back to you and hope uh, later and we go to the next speaker. We have we have Vanessa Kogan uh, from Moscow, uh, director of the Russian Justice initiative. Uh, please, are you there, Vanessa? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. you are there. Um, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm the director of the Justice Initiative, uh, and I'm based in Moscow, at least for the time being. Um, I'll get to my personal situation in a minute. Uh, our organization does uh, strategic human rights litigation in the former Soviet Union. Uh, mainly at the European Court of Human Rights, and we have a focus on Russia. And one of our main thematic areas that we uh, are targeting for um, intervention, legal intervention, is uh, gender-based violence and discrimination. And some of the issues that we work on in Russia are uh, domestic violence. And in 2019, we won the first case at the European Court of Human Rights on domestic violence in Russia. Uh, we also work on sexual violence and on secondary traumatization during uh, investigations of, of sexual violence. We also have a particular focus on the North Caucasus region of Russia, which is a 
region in southern Russia uh, that has a, a recent history of armed conflict. Two wars were fought there in Chechnya in the early 90s and in the early 2000s. Uh, and in this region, in discrimination against women is uh, much more entrenched, essentially, due to an increasing marginalization of secular law and resurgent customary norms that are now used by default, essentially, to regulate uh, many aspects of life in the region. And some of the issues that we're working on there uh, include discrimination against women in the area of family life. So that's essentially uh, a, a woman's right to participate in her child's upbringing if she divorces from the, child, from the ch child's biological father or if, if he uh, dies. Um, and we also document and litigate uh, harmful traditional practices in, in the region. Uh, and that includes honor-based violence, uh, which uh, primarily affects women and uh, members of the LGBT community in the region. And we also work on female genital mutilation, which is still practiced in several mountainous regions, uh, particularly in Dagestan. Uh, I, I myself have, uh, I'm originally from the United States, uh, but I've lived and worked in Russia for over 11 years, and I have a family that are all Russian citizens, uh, and I found out three months ago that uh, the Russian authorities had canceled my residence permit and given me two weeks to leave Russia. Uh, I'm still in Russia today because I've, of an interim measure that was granted by the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, and uh, but likely, unfortunately, unable to stay in Russia for 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 the long term. Um, we see uh, the cancellation of my residence permit as a it's just another step in a long line of intimidation uh, against our organization, uh, which includes raids on the offices of our partners that work on women's rights, uh, in particular in Dagestan. That happened uh, early last year, um, and. Uh, of course, uh, in the context of this panel, it's um, I really want to draw attention in particular to the work of our local partners, um, the situation of women rights defenders in the region uh, that are so instrumental in bringing legal cases to the national courts and, of course, to international courts in Strasbourg. Uh, the, uh, they're under constant pressure. Um, they are often faced with threats to their health and their personal security, and these threats are very rarely um, very rarely investigated. Many women human rights defenders, especially from the North Caucasus, have been forced to uh, flee the region and have not received any state protection. So um, I'll try and highlight their experiences uh, in the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. I, I think earlier when we spoke, you said that it's uh, difficult to talk about your own situation when you are working with so many that you feel are in in, in a much more difficult and more dangerous situation. To me, actually, it, uh, it, it is really difficult to imagine what kind of, uh, uh, you know, intimidation and, and, and threats on their lives and health they are experiencing, because one could imagine that you as, as, a, as, as an American uh, having much more attention to you and that the intimidation even takes place against you uh, means that that uh, it really has a completely different dimension when when you are not in that spot in that uh, you know spotlight in the same way. So it will be really really it's important to have you here. Thank you and thank you for your work. We uh, we uh, go further to Chennai. Chennai Mutam Basere. Are you there? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I would like to turn over the screen to you and, and that you could tell a little bit about uh, uh, what you are doing in and the experience of Cecilia Chimbiri, Netsai Marova and Joanna Mamombe and, and their situations. You're working on human rights defenders uh, in Zimbabwe. Yes, thank you, Eva. And I'd like to say also thank you to Equality Now for affording us this um, opportunity to share our story to learn from the other activ activist um, activities that are happening as well. Um, thank you to Jeff and Marsha for the film that indeed, you know, it raises the plight for the many Nazarenes um, that are out there. And there are many, as I will go on to share the story of Joanna, Cecilia and Mitai. And Vanessa, you're doing an absolutely awesome job with the litigation route. 
um, because, you know, we get to places sometimes where you're trying to think like, how can we help? What can be done? So please carry on with, with your efforts. Thank you. So my name is Chennai Mutambasere. I am a Zimbabwean activist. I think I can say for the last five years, I've been um, playing perhaps the role of advocating for those that are daring enough to defend the human rights of the people of Zimbabwe. And three of such people uh, that I'm going to share their story today are Joanna Mamombe, who is a member of parliament in Zimbabwe, she's age 27. Nitaim Marowa, who is a human rights activist, um, age 26, and Cecilia Chimbiri, who is 32 and a human rights defender as well. Um, the story of these three young women starts with them attending a, a protest, like you said, protesting about COVID and really petitioning the government to assist um, families that are struggling to survive the pandemic and the lockdown rules. They are in a small group of other protesters. They are maybe about 20. They leave um, maybe midday. They stop the protest. They get in a car, the three of them, to continue with their daily business. In the process, they are stopped by police at a roadblock, which is normal practice in Zimbabwe. They are then taken from that roadblock and asked to attend the Arare Central Prison by police escort. In the process, they notify the fellow protesters to say, this is what has happened to us. We are now heading for Arare Central Prison. In turn, they are also notifying the Zimbabwe human rights lawyers to say this is what has happened. They attend the prison, they're put in a holding cell, they're booked in. In that time, the chief police spokesperson at some point announces to the state that they are being held. Um, at this point, we are notified for breaking the lockdown rules. But what happens next is that their colleagues that they've been formed, that they've been, um, they're, they're going to Harris Central Prison, turn up at Harris Central Prison and these three are nowhere to be found. They go around to all the, the, the prisons in Arare, they can't be found. But what has happened in the interim is that they are taken from their holding cell. They are advised by the, by the police that we want you to go and show us where you were doing the protest. They then are taken to a vehicle where they are blindfolded and they're asked to give directions. But what they notice is that they have been driving for a lot longer than it would take for them to arrive to where they've been told they're going. 36 hours later, they are found in the middle of the night at a village that is remote and far from Arari, where they appear they have been brutalized. It's, I mean, the, the horror that they've gone through is evident on their person. It's evidence of um, sexual molestation, is evidence of torture and a very traumatic um, experience. They are then taken to a hospital, but unfortunately the persecution does not end there. In fact, in some ways it's actually just begun because what happens next is in hospital, they are being treated for, you know, for their severe injuries, some internal. They are then subjected to a court. So the, the state actually, um, force them to attend a court in hospital where they are charged with breaking down, um, with um, breaking the lockdown rules. So you can actually see from the media capture that they are actually on the drips, morphine and all that, and they are in court and they now are dressed in prison gear as they are charged. They spend just under two months in hospital and on their first day of release from hospital, they are arrested whilst they're with their trying to compile the case for their complaint. They are arrested and they are then to spend two weeks in maximum prison. So this is straight from hospital. You will see Netai is still on the crutch from a fractured leg. They are taken straight into maximum prison and the conditions like you've described, Jeff, are completely inhumane. They are in the, in the cells, in the maximum prison, Again, this is at the start of a pandemic. They are, they are to spend, it's also in Zimbabwe at that time winter. So they are to spend um, these two weeks in prison. They're being denied bail until eventually an appeal is, is heard at the high court. 
we calculate in total that to date they would have spent something like 47 days in prison, most of which are in maximum, um, in the Chikurubi maximum prison. Uh, the extent of their torture includes where um, Joanna has had a, um, ment a severe mental breakdown while she's receiving treatment admitted at a private hospital. The state file for her to be moved from a private hospital to be um, diagnosed and treated at the maximum prison. So she's moved, um, she's taken into court on the hospital bed with all the, um, you know, the, the treatment and then subjected to being moved into maximum prison in that condition. So we see that this persecution is, is so persistent to the point where about three weeks ago, they were stopped at a traffic um, police, um, at a traffic light, the police stopped them and took them into prison. They were then uh, charged with um, shouting at police officers and um, denied bail before even their case was heard, before the courts, they were sent to a maximum prison and spent about four or five days there. They are being randomly persecuted and subjected to some of the worst kinds of persecution that really affects them mentally and physically in, in, in every way. And we are seeing that this is not only persisting, but it's also escalating. So this is the situation um, that they are in. And then on top of all this, the state have themselves launched uh, uh, some charges against them they are due to attend trial on the 1st of April. And the state is saying that they are being charged with um, something like their, their case is not true. So it's a false claim, in spite of the fact that even the claim wasn't submitted before the court. So the, 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 we see that they've been tortured, persecuted, raped, and now they are being put in trial for saying that this is what happened to them. So it's, uh, it's something that I don't think in a million years you could write it down as a story. It's inhumane, it's barbaric, um, it's unbelievable. But what we are seeing is continued persecution of um, female activists. It's almost a tool that is being used to attack, especially opposition politi politics, to go and attack the females that are part of those political parties. We have seen unprecedented, um, the chief spokesperson of the MDC Alliance, Fazai Maher herself, has been, you know, she's been put in prison so many times with no charges. We have seen members of the MDC Alliance Women Assembly also being subject to persecution where they are taken in the night and incarcerated with no charge and just subjected to torture and then released. We are seeing this escalating attack on women, women who dare to speak up in the capacity of human rights defenders, or even by participating actively in opposition politics. This is what we're seeing in the, in, in the last year, especially. Thank you. Thank you, Chennai. Uh, what you describe is, of course, absolutely horrifying, and it must be for these young women, too. Um, and, and of course, it, it sounds like you know they they would somehow be like uh, be made like in some kind of uh, examples of for putting fear into others, not not uh, using their free speech. I mean, in, in a political for political purposes, and it, it seems like using women so in 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 this in this kind, I think it's particularly fearsome because we know what happens to women when they are imprisoned mm -hmm. and, and I, perhaps if you just shortly would like to continue because you took up already uh you mentioned already about uh, uh, what kind of violence and other things they have been uh subdued to because of them being women uh yeah do you think what particular threats or pressures women human rights defenders uh, face compared to men um, and, and perhaps uh, is there is there something in, in a is there an added some risk because of being both human rights defenders and uh, an and, 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 uh, activist for gender equality? 
inter intersectional risk that is the, the sort of uh, um, putting upon yeah. this previous. So I can certainly speak to the fact that we are seeing that women are, there's a, there's a sexualization of women and in terms of the abduction and torture that they face, you know, there's sexual violence involved, you know, and I am glad that, you know, we can actually start to use the, that word rape and to call it what it is, you know, a violation on women using sex of any kind is rape. And we have on, you know, when um, Cecilia narrates what has happened to her to the extent of even having um, like, like a gun, you know, being forced into her and, and, and stuff like this. And, and this is um, unique. We have had other cases of, of course, of men being tortured and abducted as well. But sexual violence specifically is being applied to women. Like I've said as well, women are almost, um, whether it is to, 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 to silence the voice of women, but when it comes to political fighting, there is a special attack or there's more attack being leveled against women that participate in politics. And it's almost a way of getting to, to, to the party and minimizing the involvement of female participation. You know, there's a real fear that more women will become active. And unfortunately, when we then look at that kind of intersectionality is that it's, it becomes like uh, you're, they're trying to silence the voices. So when we then look at um, sexual violence, so whether it's no longer about political activism or other forms of human rights activism, but sexual violence, how are you going to talk about sexual violence to the state that are prepared themselves to allow sexual violence to happen. They're actually perpetrators of sexual violence. So exactly. it, 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 there's no, you know, you've almost always got to wait out. Do I take this case before the state? How will it be viewed? How is it received or perceived by a government that does not actively persecute where a case of sexual violence is known and is even perpetrated by themselves? You know, so and and that is 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 is, is a big problem because not it also cascades to behaviors, you know, within societies and communities, because we have openly seen the case of um, the three young women, and how the state has handled that. So mm -hmm. almost uh, there is an osmosis of idea that goes there that impacts adversely on the society. Mm -hmm. How then will society view? sexual violence against women, if there's such a big case, a public case where the government is not prepared to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So it's not only and that's a when method. It becomes a personal problem. Yeah, it's also a method of oppression. I, I would like yeah. to take this further to, to Moscow, to, to Vanessa, because you are actually, uh, I mean, uh, your you, human rights defenders fighting for against sexual violence, uh, and then do, do you have this same kind of experience? Do these uh, is this something that happens to human rights defenders fighting against sexual violence too? That they are actually offended in this, per uh, perpetrated in this way, and tortured and violated. Um, well, much of what uh, Chennai said definitely rings true in the context in which I work, uh, particularly in relation to, you know, the, the importance of, of naming, including within legal procedures. So, um, you know, the fact that you can call rape, rape. Uh, and, um, you know, with in, in our work, what we've seen is that, uh, you know, some of the traditional harmful traditional practices that, that we work on, for example, honor killings, um, you know, they're, they're taboo uh, within their within the communities in which they're practiced. And so there isn't this, uh, you know, there isn't an approach of just calling it what it is, which is murder. Um, and, uh, you know, as and as lawyers, uh, it's that's essentially also a process of naming, of going to the court and calling what the whatever this practice is a crime, and calling it what it is. Um, 
uh, certainly in, in terms of intersectional, intersectionality, I mean, we've had um, what, what we see in our work is that uh, women human rights defenders certainly are are subject to a lot of the same practices that they're fighting against. And um, that often includes, for example, forced marriage uh, in the context in which we work in the North Caucasus. Uh, unfortunately, we see that when a women human rights defender, uh, often a lawyer, um, starts getting threats from, for example, private actors from the government, whoever it might be, instead of supporting her, her family decides that well, she's, you know, she's still single, she's young, she's never going to have any protection in her life unless she gets married. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we see uh, these young women rights, women's rights activists who are just starting out on uh, uh, trying to be independent, essentially, um, who essentially are forced uh, to to get married against their will. Um, and that's just uh, that's just just one example. Mm -hmm. If, if we continue, I think it's it's interesting that it's so similar. I mean, the cases and the violence used and the sort of the oppression used is so similar uh, in, in different places in the world against women human rights defenders. Uh, but Vanessa, may I continue and ask you, uh, what do you think, what does accountability look like when it's actually the government that is the oppressor or targeting women's human rights and women human rights defenders? What are there for international instruments available? What can you use? Uh, and, and is there a role for other governments uh, to hold these kind of governments accountable? What, what, what can be done? Do we have means? And what are you working with? Right. Well, um, certainly, uh, I think in the in the in the past ten years, a lot of the international, regional, international human rights mechanisms have been uh, called in to start examining uh, violations of women's rights. And uh, it's, I would say that it was a little bit of the late start. So. Um, women's rights has not traditionally sort of been on the agenda of, uh, uh, you know, many civil societies around the world, um, and especially in relation to international remedies. And I've certainly seen that in the context in which I work, uh, where the European Court of Human Rights, which is the main, uh, one of the most effective regional international human rights mechanisms has been called upon to uh, address all manner of violations in, in Russia, but until very, very recently was uh, never used, for example, to uh, try and defend domestic violence victims in Russia who are uh, essentially completely unprotected in the context of domestic law. There's no such thing as a restraining order. Uh, even the crime of assault has been uh, decriminalized. There aren't enough shelters. Um, and so essentially violence against women in Russia is at, is at crisis level. And um, what we have seen with our uh, uh, litigation on domestic violence essentially is that uh, it's essentially become the first, the first judgment that the European court issued uh, in 2019 essentially became uh, a rallying cry for women's rights activists to begin a national debate on the necess necessity of adopting uh, domestic violence legislation. Uh, in the North Caucasus, what we've seen with our litigation essentially is that every woman, so many women who come forward to bring a complaint do so under such enormous odds that essentially every victim herself becomes almost like an activist. That's the risk that she has to accept and that those are the odds that she has to go up against. Um, but what, you know, what, we, what we've seen, um, and this is in particular in relation to cases, for example, on women's right to participate in their children's upbringing, after they divorce from uh, from their child's biological father. And th th just to give you a little bit of background, there's a customary norm now that essentially regulates that um, children belong to the father's side of the family. And if a woman leaves the child's bi biological father, she has absolutely no right to participate in her child's upbringing and is usually separated from her child for years on end, um, and e even, even very, very young children. Um, and when we started to work on this issue, uh, we knew that it was a massive problem, um, but we uh, didn't didn't have many women who were willing to come forward to bring a complaint uh, because they were so often um, under pressure from not only from their former husband's family, but also from their from their own families. 
Um, but once we started to bring cases and actually show that justice was being done by winning cases at the European Court of Human Rights, uh, we saw that so many other women were essentially willing to come forward. And now we've actually been able to take it to the level where the Russian Ministry of Justice has already introduced draft legislation that would close some of the le legislative loopholes that allow for this practice to, uh, to continue in the North Caucasus. Um, and another thing that I would that I would add in terms of government, um, you know, the, the responsibility of governments. I mean, um, the, the experience of our organization. We began as an organization litigating human rights in armed conflict in Chechnya in early two thousands, and there we saw this incredible uh, interest and concern on the part of the international community on uh, gross human rights violations and crimes against humanity that were taking that were on, uh, taking place in the in the context of that conflict. And of course, women have a vital role to play in, in peace and security, and that that's widely acknowledged. And women took a lead in that region on pursuing justice for. Or, uh, victims of uh, civilian victims of the armed conflict. But as soon as it started to kind of fade, uh, so, as, so as the, you know, the, the violations became less massive, essentially the aftermath of that conflict completely fell off the agenda of the uh, of the international community. And that was right at the time when uh, really egregious women's rights violations uh, started to occur, especially, especially in Chechnya. You immediately had these local, very insidious initiatives to marginalize secular law, to enforce the headscarf um, that, you know, that was that was essentially enforced by women being attacked with paintballs in the center of the city. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that was just not that was not at all examined for a long period of time. Uh, impunity wasn't addressed for violations that happened during the armed conflict. And it's just recently come on the agenda now again, I think, and largely because of the uh, persecution of the LGBT community uh, in Chechnya that happened in 2017. And, and now there's this um, increasing awareness of uh, mm -hmm. the kinds of human rights violations that marginalized communities are subject to. But um, I think that's a real lesson for governments yeah. to ensure that after an armed conflict, um, that essentially impunity, impunity is, is addressed because there's, there's, it's clear that these kinds of violations would not be happening now if yeah. that had been addressed after that. Mm -hmm. This is almost like a classic. I mean, we see this in, in conflict after conflict that this, these are the similar situations for, for women that they actually, the violence that has uh, sort of risen very high actually continues when, when there's no limelight. And I actually, you, you just pointed out, it's very encouraging to hear that, that actually you can see that your litigation actually has brought forward also uh, amendments in legislation. And I think this is immensely important because that's, of course, that we are, are really trying to bring forward uh, change in a more systemic way. Uh, but there's something that uh, I, I, I sometimes, and in particular when I saw the film on Nasreen, I also felt that, you know, you, you don't, in particular as a politician in Finland, you don't always know that, that bringing attention and giving somebody a name, a human rights defender, a name and attention, will it actually make her case more difficult or will it support her? And, and this, of course, is, you say that it has, you have, it has helped you when you have won these cases to more women come forward. But is this really, this is something that you have to all the time probably balance with that when, when are you, I mean, when, when does it actually do harm to the people that they put themselves so much online? How, how, do, you, how do you deal with this? Um, absolutely. I mean, there's, it's definitely uh, a very fine line between empowerment uh, leading to change and progress and empowerment leading to a backlash. Uh, on the part of the authorities, and that's something that that we're seeing uh, now, in particular, uh, especially over this this past pandemic year, um, where essentially, uh, and this is one of the reasons why I said, you know, every woman, especially in the North Caucasus, that comes forward with a complaint, essentially has to become an activist, uh, because what we've seen is this um, real sort of emergence of a 
controlling narrative on the part of the regime to control narratives of violence uh, and, um, and and many many women victims uh, some some of them are I would say luckier than others they are able to evacuate or they have more means they have more agency mm -hmm. their documents weren't confiscated they can get out of harm's way um, but of course, not 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 all women are 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 reachable um you know they're and that's so much of the you know really highlights their vulnerability that um you know a, a woman you know we've we've sometimes been con we get contacted a lot by uh you know young young girls who tell us where you know I'm locked in in my room I've been locked in my room for a month my parents have taken away my cell phone you know I've just managed to you know run out and grab my mother's phone while she's out can you, you know can you help me and then and you know we start trying to organize some kind of urgent appeal uh some kind of intervention and then she just disappears and you know there's no way we know that there's no way to reach her unfortunately um mm -hmm. because we just don't have enough information and um uh, you know it's that it's that awareness that uh you know at at any time a, a woman can just disappear she just you know she doesn't she doesn't yeah. she's there and then she's not and you know that she's yeah. there but you can't you can't reach her so that's the biggest challenge that we that we face in our work and thank you vanessa i think this brings us forward to jeff and marcia actually uh, because the film on Nasreen, of course, is very much putting international attention even more than before on her, on her role and her, her immense strength that actually probably must feel also intimidating for those in, in power. Uh, what would you say, what is the role uh, of films like this um, in the effort to ensure that, that women's voices are not silenced how would you see it in general and how in particular with Nasrin? And I'm so sorry that we haven't been able to see the clicks now because we would really, it would really have been uh, important. But I hope that everybody will have an opportunity to look at the whole documentary. It is very, very strong. Please, Jeff and Marsha, you uh, have the screen. Well, first, I just want to say that um, the film actually on International Women's Day, March 8th, is going to become available internationally. So if people go to our website, Nazarene Film, you will be able to find out where you can watch it. And then it will be available. So it's currently available in the United States and Canada. So it's only a few more days till the rest of the world gets to see it. So we're very pleased about that. I, I you know, I think one of the reasons that we made the film is for, to answer this question that, um, you know, that we wanted her story told and she wanted her story told too. Obviously we were very careful. We asked her many times because we were concerned about her safety also, very concerned. And every conversation began with, are you sure? We won't make this film if you feel that it's going to hurt you. And even when we finished the film, she was, you know, we asked again, we won't release it. We'll stop right now, you know, and she was no go ahead. But I, but we feel very strongly, and it's it's something that's also thematic in, in some of our other films, that, you know, women's stories need to be told. Because we mm -hmm. did not want her story buried. You know, a lot of times, you know, men take over, men write history, and the women's stories are put aside. And so you don't know really the difference that they really made in our societies. And that was important to us and also just it's it's a thematic to Nazreen herself that she says you know we will not be silenced you know our children you know will you know need to hear from us we need to speak up yeah we, must speak we up. can't give yeah well, our children must not inherit silence, silence. I yes. think that's really a strong yes. yeah. thing she also, said again you know we didn't want her story sort of buried somewhere and forgotten can I add one thing? I, uh, uh, Chennai said something that was, um, well, I was going to say profound. All this is very profound, but um, something that's really important historically, too. Chennai, you said uh, perse persecution of women is a tool. Um, and, you know, we've seen in the United States, and I'm sure every country can have its own examples, demonization of different groups as a way of building power for one group. And, and it's even more insidious than that because um, what happens is those whose anger gets stirred up and who feels like, oh, we're the victims, so we need to take power, they're being as manipulated as everyone else. Um, and I, probably historically, the first group that was used in this form of demonization, having their rights taken away, made a victim to empower 
uh, a narrow elite by inflaming others is women. Uh, so we've seen it historically, generation after generation after generation. And if you talk about Iran, you also see this roller coaster where Iran was one of the first countries in the world to grant women basic rights. And then it was rolled back. And then it was granted again. And then it was rolled back. And we've seen that in the United mm -hmm. States. You know, great strides for women's yeah. rights in the country. And then now an attempt, you know, by some to remove contraceptive rights and to remove equal pay. Um, it's crazy and it's dispiriting, uh, but it's important to realize that it's not just accidental. It's a political tool, as you were saying. Um, yeah. I guess the last thing to say is that what you're doing is you're also not just, um, you know, uh, detailing these horrific acts, but you're also detailing a way to counter those acts. And I'd love to hear more about how in the law, internationally, country by country, we can fight back. Mm -hmm. And I think Equality Now is doing it, uh, really, really strong work and we have been working together. And I think we all need to also, I, I sometimes feel that even in a country like Finland, I, I need, we need to tell these stories to our daughters and our sons, because exactly as you said, I mean, I have been growing, growing up in, a, in, a, in my little world where we actually thought that these kind of rights were continuously moving further, that we are improving, that we can't take steps backwards. And now we have seen that, that it is possible. And I think it's important, as you say, that even in Tehran, in Iran, they have actually gone backwards. That it hasn't, uh, it, it's not about that they are sort of, it's in their DNA like somebody who is far away may, may think, or in Chechnya, uh, that it actually has gone worse. Um, we are all, I think, very much aware of this rise of, uh, I don't know what to call it, because I think conservatism is too kind, uh, because people can be conservative in a, in a peaceful and respectful way but I, but, uh, of other people and respect human rights. But I think this is something that exactly is, is much more sort of uh, authoritarian, uh, totalitarian, it's uh, extreme, uh, it's about not respecting equality uh, or human rights uh, as something that is universal. Um, and, and I think that this also must uh, affect women who are defending women's human rights. And I know if Chennai, you would like to come back to us again and, and, and tell us a little bit, how does it affect your work that there, you know, what happens in other countries also, that it seems that, it, you know, that we are a little bit scared about the future at the moment. Um, yes, thanks Eva. I think um, I'll start by saying one of the points that I think um, Jeff also highlighted around the fact that right now we are in a global pandemic. If we think about that for a second, what happens elsewhere has an impact across the world. And when we look at women and our status on a global platform, this kind of abuse and persecution happening in Iran, happening in Chechnya, happening in Moscow, in Zimbabwe, it has an impact on the platform for women everywhere and how they're viewed because it simply means that in somewhere in dictator worlds, there, there are less women at the table. And the moment that there are less women at the table, there is more adverse impact on human rights. And we have seen how that trickles across the world. So I think it's important for everyone to actually realize that when we are here talking about Nazreen, who is a mom, a wife, and she is being affected in this way, we are also talking about Chennai in the United Kingdom. We are also talking about, because ultimately it will impact us all. It will catch up with us all. And so in terms of this conservatism um, culture in Zimbabwe specifically, that has again been used as a tool to continue persecution. So when uh, Joanna Cecilia and Itai were initially abducted, as they were retelling the story of their rape and torture, some pictures, for example, would emerge on the social media claiming to be their private parts. And these were actually pictures that were taken and submitted as, as police as evidence 
to be looked after by the police. So they leaked this to social media. So immediately what they're playing on is a perception on who these women are. Suddenly we were hearing stories of whom they've dated, what their, um, you know, what their life is like, most of which of course is untrue. But this introduction of propaganda to what is deemed a conservative, you know, a conservative society is all the more damning for these people. It's for these women. It impacts them in a way that, you know, you can't, it's so traumatic because then you start to be labeled in a certain way. That is what they're aiming for. And because mm -hmm. it's a propaganda state, they're trying to suppress other media. The only message that kind of surfaces to the top is that perception that they want everybody else to have of yeah. these three women. So that again, that conservatism is being used as part of that torture, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, one of the things they did, they, they released this footage, which is ridiculous. Like I showed it to my 11 year old and they looked at it and they said, mom, this is not making sense. But they used this fake footage to claim that this is what actually happened on that day. And meanwhile, they've also tried to, to make them unworthy somehow. Yeah. Yeah. To try and, you know, so they play to, to our society's kind of principles to create an image of women who are activists, create an image of women who, you know, so if you want to get into activism, you've got to really be this perfect, like, you know, um, woman with, with, with basically no social life. And, and so it, it becomes, you've got to think about it and think, okay, if I'm going to put my, my, my foot forward and speak up for others, one of the things that is going to happen is people will come up with fake stories. Some of my private life will become public and, um, you know, and, and that is what will continue. So you almost just need to put this at the back of your mind and keep going because you expect that this is a tool that they will use against you. Mm -hmm. Dear Chennai, uh, I think we don't have much time anymore. So in the end, what would you hear at this panel and in this discussion? What kind of call of action would you like to give out to call out an action for, for your cases and for, for the work you do? Is there something... So would like to call out for absolutely i would i would make a call to to individuals to the general public at large like participate you know be activated be aware because like i said it has an impact on you it might not look like it it might not look like some something is happening in zimbabwe but what that means is there's a rise of human rights abuses against women and the more people that are, appear at a table that have this kind of mindset, it will impact you sooner, sooner or later. It will catch up with us as generations and as individuals. I will make a call to the um, civic um, society. Being an activist, particularly in countries where there is a history of dictatorship, is lonely business. And they thrive on our silence they thrive on our distant statements. So, you know, I applaud people, organizations like Equality Now that are doing something a little bit further than a distant statement to say, we stand with, stand with them physically. Let your presence be felt. Let those that are perpetrating human rights abuses, let them feel your presence. Because honestly, you know, for, for, for these three that I've been supporting, it, it's a very lonely journey. And I think I can speak to that with authority because I've been there. It's an extremely lonely journey. Your life is pretty much put on hold. They continue to speak up. They continue to stand for others. You will see them standing for other people as well. But in the most part, they're doing this on their own. You know, let's move away to the, from the civic society. Let's have a physical presence, let's be physically active, let's physically stand with those that are being persecuted for human Thank rights. You, we hear you very strongly. Uh, I would like to thank the other panelists too. Uh, thank you. And, and, and Vanessa, would you like just to finish? I know we would be like to go on really for a long time because you are doing such an in, important work, all of you but would you have something in the end that you would like to call out for? Uh, well, I think, um, of course, I absolutely stand with what, with 
So everything that uh, Shanai uh, mentioned, and, and just to remind as well that, uh, you know, in the face of this oppression, um, this, this backlash in so many countries against women's rights, um, you know, that we need to keep in mind, it often gets worse before it, it gets better. Uh, and it shouldn't be a reason to despair. Um, and uh, I, I, I'd like to leave with a, um, a request to sign a petition on a particular case that our organization is working on. Uh, it's uh, the case of a domestic violence victim uh, who died in Chechnya uh, during quarantine. Uh, she was 23 years old. She had three children. Uh, her name is Medina Umayeva. And she uh, she uh, essentially died, was buried right away. No chance for an autopsy or any kind of investigation. Um, and this was in Chechnya where uh, people in general are very, very afraid to speak out. But uh, because people found out about this and they were so outraged that there had been no investigation, they actually did succeed. Uh, civil society did succeed in forcing the authorities to carry out an autopsy. Uh, nonetheless, there um, after that happened, uh, essentially the authorities intervened and uh, threatened uh, the mother of the victim, uh, forced her essentially to retract all of her statements, and uh, also threatened the lawyer uh, who was working on the case and said that essentially anyone who uh, tries to uh, pursue an investigation will be thrown out of the republic. And uh, so we have a petition um, requesting that, uh, re requesting the investigative committee of Russia to carry out an effective investigation uh, into Medino Mayeva's death. Uh, and that would be a gesture of, of solidarity with this particular victim and essentially that her, her mother who has become an activist because of this, the, the fate of her daughter. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really important. Yeah. I hope everybody hear you and, and, and call and, and give answer to your call. And lastly, Jeff and Marsha, would you have something that you would like to call out for to end this session? Well, I just want to say that it, the work that everyone is doing is extraordinary. I mean, and it just, I'm sitting here just thinking about, you know, we women in the United States, I, you know, I, I don't think women anywhere should ever be complacent about our role in society. That, you know, I, 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 I think we are all, any society is capable, you know, of doing this to women. I mean, we see what's going on in the United States. That's a whole other conversation, but, but I, I just think it's extraordinary. And, um, and it's important for all of us to really look and see. That's how you know. That's how you know that you should never be complacent when you look and you see what is happening to women in other places. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you check, like, the, uh, make something? I, I can't say anything more than, um, you know, I know that Nazarene um, in her most difficult times has been lifted by feeling the solidarity of others. And so the more we can all feel linked together in solidarity uh, and raise our voices as loud as possible. And if you're blessed with mm -hmm. financial benefits to support these groups financially as well, um, that's just essential. Thank you. And thank you for having done the film. And I hope that if you have opportunity to, to bring, you know, our appreciation to Nasreen also and all these human rights defenders we are many really who are so, I mean, in awe and in admiration of how brave they are. Uh, I think it's extremely important that, you know, that even people like me and others who are not so, need to be so brave, we can just be, you know, doing our, uh, our part and, and giving these human rights defenders, women human rights defenders, a voice that we keep on doing that because I think it's important for everybody to see what's going on. And I, I do believe that it makes a difference. I think one of the good examples that we can do is of course, to give uh, uh, women human rights defenders a space and a floor in international uh, arenas uh, and, and a channel. And, and I, for instance, can give an example when Finland was chairing the European Union, and, and the foreign ministers had their council meeting. Actually, the foreign minister of Finland invited eight women from all the world, human rights defenders, to talk about their situations in the lunch meeting. 
and it was really informal and I, I think it made it made a be a really big impact even if if uh, if it only was a meeting so I think that we can all try to support those who are in so difficult situations doing really important work but also do our part even if uh, in a small way so thank you to all let's ensure that the human rights defenders voices are not silenced i think this is important and i thank equality now for having given us this impor important uh, opportunity we would love it, uh, would have loved to see the the clips but i guess everything can't go right even if we believe that technology is always perfect nowadays but we are happy to see the whole documentary later and those in canada and us of course already can but we in europe too and the the rest of the world. So thank you all. Thank you to the panelists, Chennai, Mutambasere. Thank you, Vanessa Kogan and Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross. And thank you, Equality Now, for having organized this. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.